Welcome everyone to the Hildebrand Project special event. Uh, this is the book release for Hildebrand's Jaws of Death, Gate of Heaven. Uh, this will be a conversation to introduce the book, present some major themes, and to talk about them. Um, I'll introduce our panelists uh, real quick, and then we'll open with uh, a prayer. I am I'm Christopher Haley uh, with the Hildebrand Project, uh, the Director of Publications and Marketing. Uh, with us, we have uh, Father Andrew Frimmel, David Mills, and Maria Federica. Uh, Father Andrew is a priest, as you might have guessed by his costume, um, <clears throat> uh, and a chaplain of a, a school in uh, South Carolina. David Mills is an author and editor who uh, worked also with the Hildebrand Project on My Battle Against Hitler and manages hourofourdeath.org, um, which is a website about Christian death and other things. Um, and then Maria Federica uh, is uh, an associate scholar of the Hildebrand Project and a professor of philosophy at Ave Maria University. Um, so with that, uh, uh, let, me, let me invite Father, Father Fremel to open with a prayer. Wonderful. Let's begin in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, you have given us the gift to participate and one of the greatest moments of salvation history, which is the death of Jesus, we ourselves also participate in death. And the gravity of this moment is one of the most serious and scariest, but potentially the most triumphant moments of our life. We ask you uh, to guide our conversation tonight, especially in reflection of this book from Dietrich von Hildebrand, and allow us to reflect on his words, but also reflect on our own lives and a way to prepare and reflect for the coming of our end, but also our beginning. May the Holy Spirit be with us tonight, be with all the panelists, as well as all the attendees. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so a little bit about uh, the, the format of this conversation before we... Um, Begin in, in earnest. Each of the participants have some, or the panelists here have some uh, remarks uh, that cover parts of the book. Um, so we'll uh, let people speak and then have some conversation about them. For you all in the audience, if you would like to submit questions during the chat, please feel free to do so. Uh, if we have time at the end, which I, I hope that we will, we'll be able to uh, answer or at least respond to some of them. So um, a little bit about the book. <clears throat> Uh, this, this was written in, in two weeks, we don't quite know which two weeks, but very near the end of Hildebrand's life. Uh, he had already had a couple of uh, close run-ins uh, with death and had been in the hospital and circulatory problems. So he, he had, uh, uh, in addition to spending much of his life you know, thinking about this, had been thinking uh, in a very focused way for, for the last couple of years. Um, so these reflections were very ready at hand. Uh, you see this a lot in Hildebrand's books. He thinks about something for decades and then writes a book about it in a couple of weeks. Uh, so th this is one of those uh, those books. It was published first in German uh, in 1980. Uh, Hildebrand died in 1977. So this was published just a few years after and then uh, shortly thereafter it came out in English as Jaws of Death, Gate of Heaven. Uh, has been out of print for quite a while. I, I don't recall exactly how long until we just brought it back uh, into print in this new edition this year. Um, so uh, that's uh, that's a little bit about about the book. I think that our our panelists will tell you tell you the rest. I mean, it's it's divided in two two major parts. Uh, basically, a natural uh, presentation on natural death and then on supernatural aspects of death. So that's kind of the format that we'll we'll follow here. Uh, so I'll I'll turn it over to you now, David, uh, who is going to tell us about the first part of the book. Yes. Oh, well, thank thank you, Christopher, and the Hildebrand Project for the um, for the invitation. So to talk about death. Um, so yeah. Now I, these are my uh, these are my. I'm going to let the philosopher and the priest do the philosophical heavy heavy lifting. These are my writer's uh, thoughts, not random, maybe scattered, but not random. And as, as Christopher said, the book is divided into the half titled "The Natural Aspect of Death" and another the other second half titled "Death in the Light of Christian Faith." And I want to talk about the first half because Hildebrand had a refreshingly honest view of the way we see and, and the way we feel death. Um, 
so I, you know, for my work, I've, I've read a lot of Christian writing about dying and death in the last few years. And a lot of it is very well meant, um, but it seems intended to deny or at least domesticate death, uh, to make it, to push it away, to make it handleable, to make it not so, not so bad. Um, and you get, I mean, you get the very, very sentimental stuff, which says things like death is just a stage in the journey and, and so on. And it's, they sort of wave away death as if it didn't matter. And of course, all of us who have lost loved ones know that it matters greatly, that it, 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 you know, it breaks something in your, in, in your lives. It leaves, you know, as I tell people about the death of my father, it, you know, he died 16 years ago, but it left a hole in my life you know, that, that, that will never be filled this time, this, this side of eternity. But you have a lot of Christian writing that's just very sentimental, tries to wave away death or domesticate it. Um, and I'll give actually two examples. And one's comic, um, sad but comic, and, and the other is tragic. So the comic one is Malcolm Muggeridge in his book, The Infernal Grove, which was the, the first half volume of his autobiography called Chronicles of Wasted Time. He's talking about being a, a journalist at the London Standard, which was run by this very wealthy plutocrat named Lord Beaverbrook. And Lord Beaverbrook, he ran, he, Muggeridge worked in a section called The Diary, which were short little items that appeared every day. And Lord Beaverbrook liked to tell the diary writers what to write because he wanted to believe certain things. So he had them write the certain things because he believed them once they appeared in print, even though, you know, even though he assigned the, the, um, the uh, you know, even though he told them to write what he wanted to write, but he, he would only believe it was in print. So, so here's Muggeridge's story. Another must paragraph that Beaverbrook had said must be in the paper entrusted to me was to point out that the bronchial complaint of which Sir James Barry was reported to be dying was known as old man's friend because it was so painless. Again, the reason was clear. Beaverbrook and as, was an asthmatic, expected Beaverbrook an asthmatic, expected to die of a similar complaint and wanted to be reassured that it made for an easy death by reading it in the diary. Harley Street was unresponsive, the medical, medical authorities, when asked to provide confirmation, but the diary nevertheless made the point and kept its little old reader happy. It's slightly comic, but, but it was an idea of the denial of death. You just, I mean, it's, just, it's going to be painless. You tell yourself, I don't really have to face it. It's, it'll, it'll go on. And the other examples, I think it, it, is a tragic one. It's the way people so often talk about miscarriage. Um, people think, say things like, you know, it's for the best, or you can always try again, or maybe it wasn't meant to be, or even this wasn't the right time anyway. And, and you hear heartbreaking responses from mothers and fathers you know, who, who, who have lost a child. And say, but it's our child. We, we lost it. It wasn't just the wrong time. It wasn't for the best. I lost a child, a real child. But it's, again, it's a way of domesticating or denying death, of, of pushing it away. And it, it's, it's often done with the best of intentions. You want to comfort. But the comfort they give isn't facing death. It's trying to deny it. And, and um, but, but think, think of what that does. I mean, um, you know, obviously some people don't think of the unborn child as a child. So for them to say it's for the best or you can always do it again, start, you, know, you can always try again, doesn't really mean much. But a lot of it comes from people who really do believe that unborn child is a child and is a, is a loss. Um, but they can only comfort the parents by denying the reality of death. So the speakers, you know, they want to share their, spare their friends the pain death brings. But to deny that a child died, they needed to deny the child existed. So with all the girl goodwill in the world, mind you, in other words, they desire to they desire to deny death leads to the inhuman denial of humanity. I mean, it's, it's, again, with all the all the all the um, all the goodwill in the world, really wanting to comfort someone, but by not facing death, by pretending it didn't exist, by domesticating it, by pushing it out of the way, they some they say things profoundly, deeply hurtful to people who have lost lost an unborn child. Um, now, Hildebrand doesn't do that. And I think it's one of the things that really, I was really excited and, and pleased in the book um, because I've read so much Christian stuff on death and it's all, you know, so much of it is to deny and to, to, to domesticate death. So he knows that the only way to face, to deal with death is to face death. So in the first half of the book, what the, the section called the, the natural aspect of death, he treats death as death. You know, it's a thing that should not be. He recognizes that. I mean, in, in the you know, in normal language, death sucks. Death is bad. Death is not a good thing. Death hurts. Death changes, disrupts, hurts, harms your life. Um, so, and, yeah. So, but it's important, I think, also to understand what Hildebrand means by natural. I think the philosopher may correct me here, but if I understand him right, he means natural to mean real. 
And our Christians often contrast natural with supernatural. So as if it's not really real, the natural is, you know, is just is kind of a stage or something. It's not really real. But I think Hildebrand really says natural. This is the way we feel as human beings. This is what, this is what our life is like. And death really hurts. Death, death, is, death is death. Death sucks. Um, for example, he, know, he talks about the way we can know that one, he talks about at some point in the, in the first section several times, that we can know the one we love still lives even though dead. He thinks that's a natural knowledge that, if, yeah, that we know for all sorts of reasons that the one we, that we loved who's died isn't, still lives in a, in, a, in a different way. But he still writes, having said that, even this awareness of immortality does not remove the dread of death, does not neutralize its sting. The frightfulness of separation remains. I even accept the many clear hints of immortality and thus am convinced of the continued existence of my beloved soul, beloved soul. But yet I yet must stare at the brutal event of her body's dissolution. I am faced with the fundamental difference between her living body and her lifeless corpse. The death of my beloved overwhelms me post-mortem after her death. The joy I once knew in her living presence is prefaced by the horror of separation by the dread of death is the great enemy of love and human happiness. So again, he, he, he just faces it flat out. He doesn't try to deny it or domesticate it. It's a horror, you know, it's, it, he calls it a horror. Um, so, anyway. so I think having come, having come to Christianity in the first place from a fairly un, un, only, only very partial like Christianized youth, I realized even after I became a Christian, I, my, my mind, I think this is true for a lot of Christians because it's, it's so in our culture, I would, I would trace, I would think about things when I thought about these things. It would go from, there'd be a trajectory from birth to death, and then maybe something else afterwards. But I, but I could, but that's, that's the way I conceived of, 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 of you know, the, way, the way life progresses. And I realized only some ways into my Christian life that, that the, Chris, the Christian actually thinks that the, the, the trajectory goes from birth to an interruption in death and then to eternity. And that makes a huge, huge difference. I mean, if you think, if you, if imaginely, you, know, I, you may believe that death goes from, from birth to eternity, but if you're thinking and fe if you're feeling that it really goes from birth to death, that makes a huge difference in the way, I mean, the way you encounter it. So, you know, if you, if you believe in the, if you actually, so you, let me back up. So you would meet, I would meet people who, who would, um, who would lose someone and they'd be, they would, generally, generally you know, upset, hurt, sad, grieving, and yet there was a joy to them. And even as a Christian, I couldn't quite, I mean, I knew about heaven and so on, but I couldn't quite feel, I mean, why are they not more upset? Why, why is this joy in their grief? I just couldn't, it took a long time to figure out that they really felt the trajectory that, that goes to eternity. So, and there's death and it's a real, it's a, it's a real separation, but they're still on the same trajectory as the people they love and they'll, they'll eventually join them as they themselves go through death. But I think imaginably, in the way we feel about things, many Christians, many of us still still do sort of feel that things end at death, and death is a, even in, whatever we believe. That's the way. That's the way we feel. Um, see. So, in wisdom, holiness, Christian maturity, however you want to put it, um, isn't just to believe the second gesture, just to, to, to feel it. I mean, to feel it the way you feel the long absence of a loved one who goes somewhere around the world for a year or two or three. Um, you miss her, but you know you'll see her again. Or like when your one spouse moves the family across the country and the other spouse has to stay for a few more months to finish, but he knows he'll be following them on the same journey to the same destination. And that's the real Christian. I mean, you'll follow them, you'll get there, you'll, you'll see them again. Um, but still, the, the, the Hildebrand sees that and obviously felt that deeply. I mean, he's, you know, he still understands, which is the thing I think is so good about this book, that death still is a disruption in this trajectory. It's not just... A, a sort of a little chasm that you'll jump over and you'll follow them the way you might follow the moving van. It's, it really disrupts things. It makes a wreck of things. And he says this at the end, the end of the first half of the book. Um, he gives the best case scenario for the natural man, the man who feels only the natural aspect of death. So he writes, the mystery and dread of death emerge from the purely natural point of view. We become acutely aware of what we leave behind. We become equally aware that everything goes on, that the earthly world continues to exist. Death remains a dark and puzzling misfortune, no matter how strongly we are convinced by rational arguments that the soul is immortal, and no matter how much this conviction has changed our lives. Our rational certainty about life after death may indeed remove our terror over the meaningless of earthly life, but it can go no further. Death seems to us a total disaster, a pure evil. 
And that's the natural thing um, to believe and feel. I mean, and I said, he, he had recognized that natural is real. It's the way, you know, it's the way we experience death. Even if we're Christians, it's the way, you know, that, again, he doesn't, he doesn't domesticate or deny it. He recognizes that natural is, 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 is natural. It's the way we feel. It's the way life appears to us and the way we feel it. Is it not the last word? It, it, the natural thing to believe and feel isn't the last word. He writes, eternity is truly the goal, the status finalis, which alone can explain earthly life and earthly existence. And it is the Holy Church that tells us about eternity. Her very reason to exist stands or falls with the reality of eternity, with the continued existence of the human soul, with the glory of the kingdom of heaven. Yes. Um, so, and he ends the, and, he, and, he, and, and and for this reason, he ends the the first half of the book, even though he's just described very very honestly the, the effects of death, with um with a prayer from the Tridentine funeral mass, which goes, "In Christ, the hope of a blessed resurrection has dawned for us, bringing all who are under the under the sad cer the certain sad sentence of death a consoling promise of future immortality." So, my final point um in these scattered po points is that. This is going to sound annoyingly pious, uh, um, but it's been reading this Dietrich von Hildebrand's uh, Jaws of Death, Gate of Heaven, um, it, really is, it really is going to sound pious, um, made me want to go to mass and adoration and confession. I mean, it's just, it was, an, I read through the book and that's, I mean, I learned a lot, I thought a lot, I was stimulated to think a lot. I was, you know, I you know, benefited from his insights, his wisdom, but the thing, the effect of the book on me was to make me want to go to mass and confession and adoration and do all those do all those things and i'm not quite sure why but it's uh, but i think it's not in the way a, a convicting homily or a, a book you read makes you want to go to confession say or go to mass because it makes you think i failed you know i've gone wrong i've got to get right with god as, as our evangelical friends friends say so the book didn't push me to what our evangelical friends called fire insurance yeah i didn't want to go to mass or confession just to you know, save myself and the other, um, and it's not in the way of a good meditation on death might, uh, because it makes you realize you, you, you're going to die. And you want to be in the best spiritual shape possible when you do. It didn't have that effect either. It didn't make me, oh, I'm, I, I, I suddenly realized I'm, I'm going to die. I got to go to confession and mass. I got to pray better and so on. It, it didn't have that effect. Um, it didn't make me want to sort of cover my backside or, or hedge my bets by going to mass and confession and adoration. I think the effect of a book like this, at least on me, was because the writer von Hildebrand was so honest about what death is and does, he makes the Christian hope all that more concrete and compelling. He really, by by drawing death as you know, is is the the thing, the the evil, the sadness, the loss, etc., that it is. He made the Christian hope all that much clearer and brighter and more concrete uh, and compelling. So it's a ground because he recognizes what what death is, he's grounded the hope. It's not in a, it's not optimism, it's not happiness, it's not nice words, it's not people saying death is only a, a you know, is, is only a, a transition point, it's only a step in the journey, it isn't that stuff. He, by, by showing how you know, the death is death, he grounded the hope, um, he grounded the Christian hope in, the, in a, it's a response to a reality. Um, and I found that at least much more compelling than any any amount of writing about death would be um, would have been to me. Um, I thought about it, the image that comes to mind is like some of those old movies when the parade comes down the street and it's a joyful thing and everyone you just have to join in and that's that's the effect the book had on me and I think it's because he was so realistic about death that when he talks about the hope in the second half it was really compelling it was really concrete because this is a man who who told the truth and therefore when he says you know, he points to the hope in Christ it was a real hope. I'm reminded of, uh, I have to paraphrase, but a, a remark by <clears throat> Chesterton, which, which is uh, sympathetic with what Hildebrand says at the end of the book, but uh, that you can only have hope when you're certain of failure. I mean, if, you, <laughs> if you think you might succeed, it's a reasonable expectation, right? Like you have, it's hope when you know you're gonna die and you know that matters, right? When you, when yes. you're just this sort of blip, uh, this, <clears throat> you know, minor inconvenience on, on the way to, you know. Yeah. Uh, you know that the attitude that it's then you it doesn't make sense to have oh uh, you have to have this this be facing this finality um, yes 
Yeah, yeah and yeah, my reaction to a lot of the things I, I read when I start, started reading about this stuff was it 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 didn't move me. I mean, it doesn't help me to tell you say it's a it's a step on the journey. Mm -hmm. and even the even the more orthodox things were were sentimental or optimistic. They weren't hopeful. You know, and, and precisely because they did they didn't try some way to to, you know, to domesticate death at least, if not deny it. I, I don't want to speak for Father here, but I, I assume that he he would say it's probably okay that you know, your concluding remarks they were pious. Uh, <laughs> they were they were very pious, but I appreciated it because I think um, unfortunately my experience of of many funerals is to David's I think original points about the domestication of of death and the sentimental aspects of death is after a funeral or when I'm preparing with the family or after the funeral, it'll always be, well, they're in a better place now, or yeah. at least they're not suffering anymore. And, you know, I'll, I'll meet with the family usually between two to three hours with the brothers and sisters or the mom or the daughter. And then you, you find out, you know, you ask about their childhood and their upbringing and their children and whatnot. And some people live very faithful, beautiful lives and there's a greater confidence in you know in their eternity but then other times they were just not good holy faithful people like at all and and then it comes across with their with the children or who the family there's great you know hurt and you know about the lives they have lived but then what comes out of the mouth or where at least they're not suffering at least they're in a better place now um and it's we can't actually presume heaven upon upon anyone. And that's one of the points that I think that I'll probably dive into a little better is I think Hildebrand really pointed out that we have to be careful about presuming uh, eternity and that Christian hope is not just, oh, well, Jesus had mercy on everyone and, you know, he wouldn't allow anyone to go to, to go to hell. But in, in reality, there's, you know, uh, the account of our sins and the account of our lives does have great weight. And I think Hildebrand was able to, to point that out throughout his book. And you know, this, uh, this point, David, that you made the domestication of death, I think very often um, people do that because they themselves don't want to enter into the suffering of the other person. And yes. they themselves I... don't, don't want to face the reality of death. And I, I very often think that these are evasion tactics on the on the part of the ones who are responding, which yeah. is which is very interesting. We we want to avoid um, facing our own death. Yeah. And as, as you said, but what von, why von Hildebrand is so compelling is because he recognizes that you have to go through through it. And and I'll I'll talk a little bit about that in my in my presentation. But um, whitewashing it doesn't actually solve the problem. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, especially because, as I said, with the case of miscarriage, it leads you to say things that aren't true, and they're actually sometimes profoundly hurting. Because if you, you, know, you deny death, you deny the humanity of, of the one who's died. But very often, it's easier to do that than to enter into the suffering of the other. Oh yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it, it's actually not. I mean, those lines aren't. My sister, my younger sister and sole sibling, died four years ago. She she'd gone to the hospital for a blood clot in her arm and. And while she they say, oh, by the way, you have terminal cancer. And uh, so I spent most of her last six months with her. Um, and um, and when she died, she really, I mean, she, she was in horrible pain because all this, the, you know, the, the tumors all over her spine and so on. And, um, and she's, you got thinner and thinner and thinner. And, and, um, and so the death was, as, as Lewis put it, a, a severe mercy in, in that sense. But then people say, you know, she, they say, well, she's not suffering anymore. She's in a better place. And... I wasn't going to argue, of course. I, I I didn't deny that, but it wasn't comforting. You know, the people who comforted were, were the comforting ones who just came up and you know they put your arm around you or they just say, you know, I've been there. I lost my sister. I lost my brother. Um, or I'm feeling for you. Or I'm praying for you. Who did in some way enter into the experience? Um, but the lines people get, I, you know, it's true that she's in a better place, but I still watched her die. She's still not in. She's not in this world anymore. It's not, I can't talk to her. I can't, you know, we can't invite her up here for Christmas. I mean, but just saying she's in a better, it didn't really help. But what helped was some degree, even if it's very distant, some degree of solidarity of, of 
engagement and, and, and so on. That really helped. Greatest gift we can give at death, I think, is silence and prayer. Yes. Um, because if you, if, <laughs> we, we know when people are trying hard to <laughs> And it, it, it's actually more painful when, when you say these pious things that are oftentimes even theologically incorrect, that sometimes just coming up and hugging them and saying, I love you, is way more meaningful than saying, well, they're in a better place. It's like, yeah. just, just hug me and say I'm praying for you, because that speaks to the soul much more. Um, but I think people, to Maria's point, speak out of their own insecurities when they when they say they're in a better place or whatever comment they say, they're 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 afraid to face their own and um, you know their own potential death and and kind of uh, to your point, washing whitewashing the reality of death. Uh, they're afraid to face it and enter into it their own self, and that that usually comes from insecurity yeah. and fear. Yeah, I remember a, a friend of mine who's both whose who's mother and brother were very sick, were invalids. The, and the ambulance was always coming to, to pick up one or the other. And um, he was told the story of the ambulance came, his brother was very sick, they had to go to the hospital and call the ambulance, the ambulance guys came in and they started to go to his mother's room because they were used to it. And he just, he pointed to the, the brother's room and the, one of the ambulance, the guys with the, the gurney turned and said, sucks to be you. And he found that very comforting. He said he wasn't he wasn't offended. He found that very comforting. Someone just recognized what he was going through and said it in four words. You know, didn't 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 say anything pious or comforting or anything. He just said he just it was basically a gesture of solidarity. So it sounds uncomforting. He said I I, I was really happy. I was really comforted by that. I was just grateful for someone who recognized what I was going through. You know, what comes to mind is that Mother Teresa. She explicitly said the point isn't, the main point is not to alleviate suffering, but to be with those who suffer so that they're not alone in their suffering. And I think that's what probably our response should be when we're, when we're with somebody who has lost somebody who's very close is to enter into their suffering with them. And, um, and anyway, that's, that's what people very often flee because they don't want to feel the suffering for themselves. Yes. It's and, not easy. It's not easy. To bring it. What you all are saying a little bit back to the to the book here, something that Hildebrand says that, it, that uh, about death is that you know, and, and this idea uh, that it's a, a cessation of pain and you know everything's fine now. He says that that denies the reality that death is a great loss, even for the one who dies. Right? Like it's a loss to not be alive, even if things get better in some other ways. Like it's still a real material loss to be separated from your loved ones and all the things that make you happy in life. Um, and we don't talk about it like that, right? And so Maria, when you say that, you know, people don't want to enter into the suffering with other, other people, they don't want to, it's not just that we don't want to confront our, our own. I think it's a, a real lack of, of empathy with, with the other person. Um, we don't want to enter into their suffering and, and recognize that this is a loss. Um, and it's, it's, if you don't, realize that then you end up you know, with this you know kind of happy-go-lucky um, domestication as you say, of, of death so um yeah, but if you don't have that right if you take that seriously um and this this i'm going to transition to the second part of the book now but he has this wonderful line right right in that first chapter which is uh that focus on eternity increases the importance of the earthly life and makes it even more meaningful and charged with dramatic interest um, I think that's a, oh, that's a great, great starting point. But so that's, uh, you know, when you take this long, long arc that David was talking about, that doesn't make this life less important, it makes it more important. Um, so uh, with that, Maria, um, what's the, the supernatural aspect of death? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so, um, so thank you to David for um, highlighting, I think a very important dimension of the first half. I, I like your interpretation, David, of the two meanings of natural. <laughs> Um, natural in the sense that um, we, we have to face what's really happening. In that first half, Hildebrand um, takes another meaning of natural, which is specifically the contrast with the supernatural. And I'll just begin with, with that one first, because he does, he does in the first half talk about the way in which a, a death can appear without, without the supernatural perspective, without the promise of eternity, 
without actually specifically the revelation of Christ that gives us so many details about the afterlife, he says death can seem a very dark and meaningless thing. And in that sense, an unmitigated horror. Something happens, it's the end of everything we know, and that's it. And he says that even the most sublime guesses is what to, as to what happens after that death, as in the Platonic or the Plato's vision, where he has a very strong sense that the soul lives on. He says, still, there's not a certainty there. And one of the things that I think is so beautiful that Hildebrand does is he says that um, with Christianity, death becomes very meaningful. He says, first and foremost, because we understand that it's a punishment for sin. And I, that's not something that I would initially think I would find here, but he says it's the very fact that sin is a punishment that takes it out of the meaninglessness that one would experience in the non-supernatural view and the natural view of death. So I, I, I found that a very beautiful way of, of transitioning. Um, of course, he then also says it, 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 it actually gives dignity to life because it becomes the doorway to our eternity, it becomes the way that we enter into actually what life is really about, which is living in eternal bliss in, in union with the most blessed trinity. So, so for him, the, the uh, supernatural view really opens entirely new vistas in this way and gives tra already transforms uh, the experience of death, even though it won't take away the, the pain of loss. He just says in terms of meaning now, we have something entirely different. And so then he tells us that, that death in the Christian view, he says, well, what's more specifically, what's the aspect that death then takes on? He says it has a sort of a twofold aspect, and this is kind of a theme then in the second half. He says it becomes the point at which we are actually judged for how we live this life. And the second aspect is the blissful union with Jesus. So and the first one, of course, induces a kind of what he calls a holy fear in us. And the second one induces the hope of mercy, that the, the promise that so God in his humanity through the redemptive act holds out for us now this invitation to union with him and all of the promise of mercy that inevitably comes with that. So these are the two, the two kind of the face, the two faces of death that he says have to actually be held together. And I think Father Andrew will probably uh, talk about the first dimension, but, um, but keeping these two in balance that we have to, we have to realize that part of the dignity of death is the fact actually that we're going to be judged. And then of course, this in turn gives meaning to our an entirely new meaning to our existence, all right? It becomes dramatically important. Everything that happens in this life has implications for eternity. So with, with those two things then he navigates, he says, we have to be able to hold both of them together. Um, the, the experience of mercy, he says, has to have the upper hand, but it doesn't entirely swallow up our sense of the fact that we are going to be judged at some point for what we did, how we used our time. Oh, and so, so and, and then what he does is, which I also appreciate very much, is he said, how do we make this real in our lives? So the second half of the book is where he talks about, we can know this with Christianity. We know these two truths, these two aspects that life takes, that death takes on in Christianity. How do we make that real in our lives? And that's another, I think, very important contribution of the book is he says, we have to um, have faith. We have to deepen our faith. He says, but that's not enough. If we want to overcome this natural fear of death or um, have it somehow transformed, we also have to grow in a love of Jesus. I think that's very beautiful that the really the drama, the terror of standing before the judge, faith isn't enough to, to, to rob us of that terror. We actually need to have um, what, what sounds to me like a kind of delicate, intimate relationship with Christ, where we have actually experienced his personal love for us, his personal desire for union with us. And only in this way can this deep awareness of being held accountable uh, be somehow endurable for us because we know that Jesus's mercy, God's mercy is all enveloping and all encompassing and is, is really going to have the final word. 
So, um, so that's that's a, a number of other important points I think in this in this section. But maybe I'll pause here at least and and see if you know somebody wants to make some comments or maybe Father Andrew wants to take it up from here and give some examples of of his experiences. <laughs> Yeah, Maria, you you bring up, I think, one of the underlying themes of of the book, uh, which come on the first half and on the second half, and that is really this this focus on a, the account of one's life. So obviously, there's this recognition of one's sins, um, moral actions, but then also that relationship uh, that you have with the Lord or not. And that if you have a relationship with God, that will also affect how you accept death itself, how you will experience death itself. Um, one of the quotes that hit me right at the beginning of the book, uh, I thought was a pretty thematic throughout all of it. And Dietrich von Hedelbrand said, I must face the fact that I am losing the fight. It is time for me to face death and I have accepted it. And so he came to the conclusion that he had to accept death himself. Every person comes to a certain point in their life that they have to accept death and enter into the terror and the fear of death, but also the hope for eternity. But you can't get to the hope of eternity without also experiencing that terror that one goes through in the moment of death. All four of us here and all of the attendees and whoever will watch this doesn't actually know what death is like until we are in it. And um, one of the great things I got from this book is really asking myself, and I hope those who read this book is asking themselves, how am I going to respond in the moment of death? Uh, am I prepared for death today? Have I loved well? Have I lived well? And, you know, through the years of ex ministry that I've had so far, I've been in hospital rooms, hospital chaplaincies, I've been in palliative care units and being by deathbeds of, of you know, five day old babies who have passed away to 95 year old men who are the most stubborn people in the world. And, and, and all of them face death differently. Um, but there's an account at the end of the day that I think um, makes us not domesticate death uh, itself. Um, and so I, I, I think that's even bringing a little bit of David and Maria from that point of view is we have to also wait the account of our lives before God and that itself will be a real judgment. Um, and I could go on, but if any of you have any comments there, I think that it might be an opportunity. You know, e even in the in the natural aspect of death, the section that he talks about sort of the grandeur of this last act, right? That we that we recognize the finality, um, and that this is a this is a moral act, right? Even even if you're not prepared to meet your Maker, as it were, uh, to be judged by God, like you, there's still this awareness, and he draws on. on Plato and the accounts of Socrates, um, and you know, this this notion that the the philosopher's life is a preparation for for death, right? the thoughtful person, the serious person, I should say, right? which which makes me um, think of another passage I really love uh, later in the book. This is this is on page eighty five in the, the section on how Christ transforms death. He says, "Many of us fail to understand the importance our conduct has in God's eyes." We don't take ourselves and our conduct seriously. We deem anthropocentric the idea that our lives possess a moral and religious significance important to God. Uh, this really stopped me when I read it because I think normally when we think about people not taking death seriously, judgment seriously, um, we think, oh, well, they're not taking God seriously. Right? Mm -hmm. They're 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 not taking uh, you know the afterlife seriously. Their teeth, whatever it is. Not they're not taking themselves seriously, right? So I think Hildebrand really inverts that, and and it, it struck me that like what that's what often is really happening is we're not taking our own lives seriously, right? and again this goes back to this this Hildebrandian theme you see again and again and again that was his the, the motto to it or his attitude where this concerns you, right? This is a matter of the heart. This is a matter of great personal importance. Um, if you were to take your life seriously, um, you would take your death seriously as well, um, and to be flipping about death 
uh, in general, another person's your own, is is to be flipping also about your own life too. And I found that, yeah, arresting. Yeah, I underlined and bolded that that line from Hildebrand. Actually, my book is open to page eighty-five, so it's probably <laughs> of not taking death seriously. But there, there's also the reality. I mean, we people in the church speak about how there's been bad catechesis for generations. Also, who teaches us how to die? I've never heard a homily about how to die. You know, I've never had anyone tell me like, hey, this is how you die. Like there's, I think there's also the reality of how does one even prepare for death if no one has shared with us how to prepare for death. And unless you're with someone at the moment of death, there's that lack of experience and knowledge. Um, and so I wanna share a story uh, about a man who I, I don't think knew how to uh, take death seriously because I think fear kind of overpowered him. Um, this was in my previous assignment where a man was uh, probably within a week of, of passing away. He calls for the priest. The priest shows up who happened to be my pastor and, you know, wanted to offer confession and anointing. And the guy essentially said, I, you know, I'm, I'm fine. I'll just, you know, you, you can go. So, you know, father just said, okay, well, I'm on my way. So he leaves. Then he calls for a priest again. Another priest shows up and he says, you know, I don't want confession. I don't want the sacraments, you know, whatever, go. And then I get a phone call. Of course, it has to be, you know, on my day off. I'm shorts and a t-shirt. I'm literally getting in the car, heading to the mountains for some hiking and geysers. I get the phone call. And of course I change. I head to the hospice center and um, I walk in and the first words were, hey, father, welcome. Uh, I really would like to, to schedule an appointment with you. And like all the insides of me were like, are you serious? I'm here. And um, I sometimes uh, lack a little bit of tact. So uh, <laughs> I essentially told him that I, I just spoke to his doctor in the hallway and he has um, less than 48 hours to live. Uh, so I'm probably the last priest you'll ever, you'll ever meet. So at that point, I asked the family to leave the room and it was just me and and him. And um, I point blankly asked him, what are you afraid of? I'm the third priest in seven days. You've kicked us out the door. You try to kick me out. What are you afraid of? What are you running from? And after kind of an extended pause, he said, okay, father, <laughs> you got me. I'm like, well, I didn't mean to get you, but he said, uh, I've been away from not just the church, but from God for 45 years. And every decade, God tried to enter back into my life. And every single time I actively said no. And I lived the life I wanted. It was a very selfish life. And I always knew it was selfish. And, and now I'm afraid because I've wasted my life. I said no to God. I didn't love well. I, again, was very selfish with my life. And I don't think I deserve the mercy of God. And at that point, like my heart drops for him, but also goes out to him at that moment. Because when I hear someone say, I don't deserve God's mercy, I just want to slap him in the face. I'm like, you're exactly why Jesus died on the cross. And so I shared with him the story of the parable of the prodigal son. And, and I shared with him, well, you know, in one sense, from an earthly point of view, yeah, he, he deserves to be the servant of his father. Uh, and you've been unfaithful for, for decades. But you know what? What that son and what you have never lost is your, sh your sonship. You've never stopped being a son of the father. And even though you did waste gifts, that God has given you at this moment, you, you have the love of the father. You never lose your sonship. And I said, God wants to give this to you. And, and at that moment he said, well, well, I would love to go to confession and had a beautiful 45 minute, just like crying kind of confession. Both of us were moved by how the Holy spirit worked in this moment. Um, because it was God's grace and God's conversion. Um, and it, it happened to be a moment that 
I was having a bad day and I just wanted to slap the guy in the face. Like you're not getting another priest. And it's amazing how God can work in those moments. Um, and I love these moments because there's still a conscience in the person and they realize that they could have loved and lived better and that they were unfaithful to a relationship that God wanted. But I can't tell you how many times that I've, I've engaged into a person who was two weeks from death, a month from death, a few days before, and, and they think everything is, is fine. There's, there's no desire for mercy, no desire for, um, confession there's a presumption of god's mercy but same story over and over you know decades away from god and they just know they're going to heaven and that's that's hard for me because it's i feel like the sacraments at that moment are are just like a magic wand and and there's not a real sense of sorrow so just in conclusion of my point here one of the great things i think hildebrand was able to emphasize is how beautiful the mercy of God is and the mercy of Jesus is and that he wants to offer it, but it presupposes that you are actually sorry for your sins, that there's a distinct sorrow that you have looking back on your life and looking back on the sins that you have committed. And in my experience has been too many people that don't have the first, they're not sorry and they don't feel like they need to be sorry, which makes the acceptance of God's mercy much harder when you think you're you're fine and you're going straight straight to the lord um, <clears throat> is there a is there a way as a priest or even as a friend you can get around that or beyond it i mean you do you ask for example if they say you know i is one fellow in the same situation once said to me me and god are tight Mm -hmm. and by his life he said no i don't think so um but is, is there i mean you you find say so, well okay if you think you're you're fine with god are you not fine with someone you care about is there a broken relationship is there is there some way of sort of of making them see they have things to be sorry about and then working working farther absolutely that that is the exact uh course i take because being able to recognize the brokenness in other relationships then begins to say, well, love of neighbor <clears throat> connected to love of God. Um, but unfortunately, um, I think what happens is when the heart is so hardened for so many years, I've seen that it gets to the point that you, that somehow they can't recognize that they need God's mercy. Like almost the, the Pharaoh's heart was hardened that, you know, it was almost like he was at a breaking point. He like, <laughs> I, I could see potential conversion on Pharaoh, but then it was, it was for so long um, that his heart was hardened. So, I mean, to share another story, I mean, there was one day that I had virtually two men that had the same story. I go into one hospital room and um, very stubborn older gentleman. And every time I tried to engage the, exactly what you're saying, David, like, are there broken relationships? Do you feel like uh, you need to ask forgiveness for them or, or, or sorry that you've done something wrong? And the more I tried to, to push, the more he dug his foot in, in the dirt saying that he was fine and he didn't do anything wrong. Mm -hmm. And to me, he was just gaslighting me. And then finally, he just kind of kicked me out of the room. And then I literally, the next person I went to was similar situation, stubborn older gentleman. And, but this time I, I pushed much harder and stayed there for 45 minutes to an hour and kind of like really fought with the man in a lot of ways and challenging um, the actions in his life. And then he did finally come to a conclusion that he was prideful and he never let go of his pride and the decisions in his life um, were based off of his own pride and selfishness. And, and that was a moment where God broke through decades of pride. Um, but I mean, these are moments where I, like, I'll tell you, David and Maria and Christopher and everyone else, I pray, I love, I'm in the room. I try to guide and ask questions and, and, and ask them to make an account of their life. But sometimes there's such a, a, a built up of sin around the heart that God can't always break through. And, 
and there's moments like the first guy where I'm forced out of the room and there's other people where I see God breaks through and there's a beautiful moment of, of conversion and confession and preparation for death. Um, and, and I sometimes leave the room overjoyed by the way God entered into someone's heart. And then other times I'll walk away, you know, worried for a person's salvation because they, they, in a sense, knowing or unknowingly was pushing God away, even at the last moments of their life. So uh, Hildebrand talks about people who have given up hope and <clears throat> don't have, you know, take their, take their life seriously, have no repentance. He talks, um, tells the story of, of a, a young man he knew who had taken his own life and written before he did, you know, God forgive me, um, uh, which is a strange paradoxical thing. Um, but Maria, you, you had talked earlier also about um, suicide as a topic we might discuss tonight. And I have a, a question uh, in the chat as well about that. So I, I thought maybe this would be a, a good moment to, to plumb that. So um, yeah. oh, so you, you want to talk about the, the, the passage on suicide now? Yeah, um, and I mean, it's, yeah. this is a, a bit of a stretch of a tangent, but from what Father sure. uh, Father Primo was talking about, uh, this hardening of the heart and a lack of hope and lack of repentance. This is, yeah. um, I'll turn it over to you. I know you have thoughts on this already. So. Well, so so Hildebrand um, says that this understand, taking our own lives seriously in the sense of understanding that our actions, our moral actions really do matter, he says meditating on that will help us also to avoid suicide because suicide is or avoid the temptation to suicide or resist it because uh, we have to keep in mind that suicide is it's a mortal sin if to use the technical language of the church and that through this act we actually cut ourselves off from the possibility of salvation and he writes very strikingly about that he says look in this aspect, supernatural aspect of death, the first one, the judgment, is where we face the fearful choice between an eternity of bliss or eternal punishment. And suicide actually puts us in the position of at least seriously risking eternal punishment. And he says that thought should serve to help people not to consider um, suicide as a way out or to the resist the temptation if they do have that temptation. And I think that it's certainly, um, I'm, I'm certain that it must be salutary to, to form one's moral life as strongly as possible so that when the temptation or if the temptation to suicide arises, of course, this is going to have some effect on it. But, but um, I, did have, I did have the question, uh, nevertheless, as to whether or not in the face or the temptation to suicide tends to arise in situations that in some way you could say things go off kilter so that the normal framework of our life somehow is no longer operative and therefore no longer sufficient to help us deal with the situation. So, um, and this isn't to um, minimize the evil of suicide, but it's merely to say that the temptation to suicide tends to occur in very extreme situations where there's some unresolved suffering. And at that moment, um, the rational framework does tend to break down. And that's where I think that another, another perspective perhaps could be brought in. But Hildebrand himself says, uh, I don't have that page open right now. He says, I think he gives a very, very important caveat to what he's saying. I speak, he says, of the cold premeditated cases of suicide. I do not speak of those cases of, uh, the example he gives is of a nervous breakdown where somebody finds himself at the end of his rope. And he says, at that point, we, can, we, we can't hold this person to the same moral standard any longer, individually in this case. And I think that it's, it's, that's probably a very, very important consideration is why we never are meant to judge somebody who has committed suicide because we do not know their interior state. We don't know whether there was a moral transgression or whether alternatively, there was some tremendous sorrow and suffering that precisely became 
unendurable for that person. And death then becomes the means of escaping from an unendurable suffering. And um, of course, what it should give rise to for us is, is the considerations of community. Was this person alone in their suffering? Are we somehow responsible? And um, I, think, I think, I know that for me as a professor at a university, I'm becoming more and more aware of the fact that there are so many young people walking around with their sorrows alone in tremendous isolation and loneliness. And I think that the conditions for suicide tend to develop precisely here when somebody is alone in their suffering. So I think that, that what Hildebrand says is, is correct. And um, I think he even gives us enough in that footnote to have a whole picture of suicide. But I think it's important to keep in mind these two sides, the moral side, but also the what's called the psychological, the emotional and psychological side, which we know classically can remove responsibility in, in a case like this. Oh, Christopher, I think your your microphone is off. <laughs> All right. Well, I wasn't even saying anything. I was just asking if our panelists had something to say. <laughs> so, um, but thank you uh, for those, yeah. those remarks. Um, we're, we're we're nearing uh, the end of our time here, so I, I want to uh, just go ahead and invite anyone else who has uh, other questions to go ahead and, and type them in either through chat or just Q and A button here. Um, try to get to them. Um, <clears throat> one topic I wanted to bring up as well that we haven't touched on much that Hildebrand spends a lot of time on in the book is, is hope. Um, and I think this is an extremely interesting presentation of hope and, and in very Hildebrandian fashion. Of course, he distinguishes this from expectation and wishing and willing and all these things that might seem a little bit like hope and from natural hope and supernatural hope. Um, and uh, you know, there, there's, there was some stuff in here I thought was really new, um, at least to me. Um, this is uh, starting on, on 70, and then we'll look also at the appendix on, on hope. Um, but he says that uh, hope is one of these uh, a basic human attitude in which we can we see a primordial link with God, our undeniable metaphysical situation of creaturehood, and our total dependence of God, win acceptance over all theories and opinions. He goes on to say, in other words, hope always contains a value response. Even though its formal object is what is objectively good for me, hope is also a response to God's independent goodness and his loving kindness. Right here lies the decisive difference between hope and all wishing and expectation. Uh, I have been looking for a long time for the decisive difference between those things, and I was glad to find it, uh, find it here. Uh, this, this idea of hope as a value response, right? a response to the value being even implicitly understood, if not explicitly and thematically understood, value of an all good loving God, right? Who might help in this situation. Um, that it has this, uh, even as for, for, for the atheist, it has this tie into, into God because it's different than expectation. It's different than willing. Um, and I had always thought, personally, I would always thought that, yeah, there was, in fact, you know, there was a closer relationship with, with hope and expectation. And uh, I think Father Father Andrew and I we were talking about this recently about, how, <clears throat> like in the Greeks, they have this, the word is elpis that they use, and it, it's it's this tighter notion of hope and expectation. You know, um, the Hildebrand notes that you can't, like, you would never hope for something bad. You expect you might expect something bad, right? So hope doesn't account. For for that and then hope is not willing because you can't do it of your own power um, and hope is not wishing because wishing is something that you can also accomplish I, I might wish that this happened and will that it, that it happened but hope is necessarily beyond us it, it requires this sort of belief um, <clears throat> in, in an all good all knowing God and it requires of course also as we talked about earlier that realization that you can't get out of this, right? The death is death is coming uh, no matter what. Um, which is hope is the very opposite of willing and a crucial respect. In hope, we necessarily grasp that the realization of the desired state of facts emphatically does not lie within our own power. Uh, and ends by saying hope has an element of conviction. 
this fact clearly distinguishes hope from the mere wishing of something to happen. Um, and so you see the draw to immortality in this, right? Even this natural understanding of immortality that we might hope, even to hope for a good death, right? Uh, even hope though at all. And because it requires this power beyond yourself. And the only thing that really we are all powerless before is death, right? Like the death gives you this impetus to hope. Um, and hope, he says, that nourishes love and it feeds the other to theological virtues. And so uh, I think you get this, because you get this emphasis on the significance of the natural aspect of death in Hildebrand, you get also uh, this emphasis and this invitation to hope. And you see also as a result what happens if you don't, but if you don't take that seriously, uh, you you will not be sort of spurred on towards this, towards this hope. Uh, I found that very helpful, very clarifying. Um, and you know, it was it's sort of it's a way that this greater emphasis on the, on living through, passing through the natural terrible instance of death, um, that is what gives it hope, right? But I mean it makes it less gloomy, uh, I, I guess. So uh, I wanted to bring that up. Uh, if anybody else has any comments on on that, I'd be happy to hear them. I don't have any initial comments to you, Christopher, but we just received about three or four questions. So oh, great! I'll uh, I'll go ahead and read one that I think Maria um, might be able to speak of from a, a sense of the second half of the book a little bit more about hope for those who are not Christian. Uh, one of the questions said, "Does Hildebrand say anything about dying for agnostics? What can we as Catholics do for friends who do not believe that there is anything out of death?" Maria, did Hildebrand speak of anything about that? No, he, he doesn't say anything about that. No. Um, I, yeah. So I read maybe between the lines on a couple of things in this question. And um, one of the things that Hildebrand speaks about um, kind of in a very scary way, uh, but <laughs> also true. He says, we take upon ourselves a frightful guilt when we fail to respond to Christian revelation and to God's epiphany and Jesus. And so as, as much as he's scared about the frightfulness of death itself, he also points out about how it's going to be much more frightful and scary at the moment of judgment for a person who did not follow our Lord and could have. And so it's not very, um, I mean, there, there's really not a great way to, to sugarcoat some, something about that when someone, for whatever reason, has, you know, chose not to follow our Lord. Obviously, there's a lot of things about experiences and how people were raised. I don't think that we really need to get into that question. We could spend another hour on that. Um, but I, that would really be my only response from something he said about um, the necessity of, of following our Lord. That is the only hope we have for eternity. And mm -hmm. when that's taken out of the equation, uh, equation then really the, the only thing we have is, is really putting God's eternal mercy and just bestowing that upon any person who doesn't believe in God. Mm -hmm. and, and that's where our prayer and fasting and offering masses and even David's uh, original point about going to confession and going to adoration and going to mass more, our heart should also grow with great compassion for others uh, who do not know God because there is that scary reality at the moment of judgment of what will happen if they did not follow our Lord. Yeah, and in a sense that really goes beyond the scope of the book, that question, because the book is actually about our experience of death and, um, but it does, Father, as you say, tangentially, it does, uh, of course, make you aware of what the conditions for salvation are. And, and you speak beautifully about the need for charity towards others and praying for their salvation. But there is another question here that's directly relevant. How do we prepare ourselves, not just for our own death, but for the death of our loved ones, especially the, our elders? Um, the a latter almost seems harder to me. And it's interesting, this question is interesting because most of what Hildebrand does in the second half is actually to, um, I, I think it's primarily serves 
to alleviate the fear of my own death. That's the bulk of it is spent. I mean, first he just describes objectively the character of death, how it changes. And of course, the main thing that would do is meditating on this would change the experience of facing my own death. But at the end, he has a couple of beautiful short chapters on death. He calls it the chapter 16, for example, death and the ultimate fulfillment of love. He actually speaks somewhat to this issue of how do we deal with the death of someone that, uh, that we love. Although I will say this, and I wonder what the other panelists would say, um, David, you spoke so compellingly about this natural aspect of death. Um, I'm not sure that Hildebrand directly tells us how is it that um, the, the tremendous um, experience of, of thinking that the one that we love is suddenly going to be gone or my own separation, if I'm dying from the one that I love and from everything that I know, he doesn't directly tell us how these sufferings are alleviated. I think what he's doing is he's giving us a picture of death that if we meditate on it, if we incorporate it, as he says, um, into our transformation in Christ, he says the proper attitude towards death is part of our transformation in Christ, which I think is very beautiful. And I think that the idea is um, there's so many other things that he says in this book, by the way, for example, he tells us the way in which meditating on death suddenly puts into a correct hierarchy, all of the um, activities, all of the concerns of our life and so forth. Now imagine if from day to day, our hierarchy was getting put more and more in order, then can you imagine, I can imagine that when we come to the moment of death, we're not caught flat footed. We're not saying to ourselves, oh, woe is me. I was concerned about this. And I, I realized I should have been concerned about that. So if this, I think this meditation on death, in a sense, he's, he's, he's exhorting us to a Christian tradition, this meditation on death, the memento mori, which is remember your death, oh brother, the way in which the uh, monks greet themselves very often, memento mori, remember your death. It's not morbid. It's actually, as he says, it's the condition for a very happy life to remember where we're going. And I think that um, the dealing with the love, with the death of our, of our beloved actually fits into this as well. If we have been incorporating into our life this continuous sense of where we're going and what this life is about, when our beloved dies, I, I think that David's right. I don't think that the anguish on one level can be taken away, but I do think that the sting can be taken out of it. It's probably the best analogy I can think of. And he, Hildebrand speaks about the way in which in death, there's going to be an ultimate fulfillment of love. Now, this sounds rather abstract. He says, look, you've, you've, all you've desired with your beloved is the closest possible union. And Hildebrand tells us, look, union in Christ is the, the way to get closest to your beloved. And don't you realize that when you two are in heaven is when you're going to actually achieve this long for union. Again, it's rather abstract unless somehow we have become um, transformed, so to speak, in our vision of really all of the experiences of our life in the light of the fact that someday we are going to enter into eternity and that's what this life is about. So that's, I hope that wasn't too long winded, but that was my answer to this, this very good question about how do we deal with the death of a loved one. Yeah, that, that was very helpful. Thank you. I appreciated that. Um, but to bring it down a little farther, more mundane, one thing people have asked, uh, I say, is very simple, is that you, what's the, um, keep close accounts, I think is the expression. Is the, the loved ones, I mean, it's, it's very easy to say about your mom, your dad, your cousins, who, your friends or so on. You know, I really care about and love them. And you keep them at a distance. So one way to prepare for their death is, is to be as close to them as you can. And that may just mean praying for them regularly every day. Um, it may mean more practical or more direct, I'm sorry, not more practical, but more direct physical mm -hmm. things. So in part, you, you, prepare, you prepare for their death by loving them to the greatest extent you can. And with most of us, we can, you know, I think about, I'm, I've lost both my parents as well as my sister. And uh, you, you look back and said, I should have written, they were hundreds of miles away. I should have written more often because you know, my mother really liked letters. She wasn't so big on phone calls, but she really liked letters. And I could have done that more often looking back and that would have meant a lot to her. 
Um, so then you can, you, as you think about those things, reflect on your own life. But but one very one way is is simply you know is simply to love them in in every way possible. It starts with prayer and regular prayer for them and sort of engaging their lives in that way. And then whatever you can do for them, so that when they do die, that you you your relationship is closer, it's tighter, um, which make it hurt more in some ways. Um, but yet you will feel I. Yeah, I've done everything I could for them. I love them to, to the, you know, I love my loved ones as much as I could. And that makes a big difference. So that's neat, David. What you're saying is we shouldn't only meditate on the possibility or the coming of our own death, but meditate on the death, on the coming death of our, of our loved ones. Yes. And also know that when they die, you can have masses for them. You can pray for them. You can even earn indulgences for them. You, they're still not, they're still not beyond our care. Yeah. I mean, they're still you've lost them and that hurts. I mean, that just really hurts, yeah. but you can still care for them in very practical, very concrete ways the church gives us. Both your reflections were, were beautiful. And, and I think David, you also shared with us a witness right at the beginning about how you spent, was it the last six months of your sister's life with her? And I mean, you just, you hit it on, on the head. You spend time with your loved ones who is preparing for death and and it helps us to prepare for death when we know that our friendship our relationship our spousal relationship is more intimate than <clears throat> ever has been before um and so i think what can give a person peace about a loved one who's dying is when you know where they are spiritually and i can't tell you how many awkward hospital rooms or, or homes I've been in where you have family who have been estranged and they bring the priest in and most of, oftentimes they don't know me and I'm trying to engage, you know, the person, but I, I can't because I can feel the tension of, oh, the son hasn't been around in, in 15 or 20 years or, oh, the daughter-in-law never forgave the mother-in-law. And sometimes I, I just have to like ask the family to leave so I can just like talk to the person there, but then I'll also talk to the family and say, listen, y'all need to get out your grievances because you can't fix things once someone dies. This is at least the time to ask for forgiveness. So that's a little bit of a tangent, but my, my point, what I was trying to get to is when you spend time with someone who's preparing for, for death, talk to them about their relationship with God, asking them what their fears are. How is God um, offering them peace amongst the fear of death and, and loss and losing friendships and family and not being able to see the grandkids grow up? Or I think just asking questions of saying, what are your fears? How is God a part of this? Is able to open up a, a, a wonder of a relationship that you may have never even entered into before. And death gives that oftentimes a freedom that you haven't had before because there's it's imminent your relationship is days weeks months that is imminently going to end and and there's actually a beautiful freedom that can come with spending time but asking those hard questions and then praying together and realizing that god can enter into those moments and then at the moment of death it can be one of the most peaceful moments um, that you've experienced uh, because god's grace is in that moment compared to fear overwhelming a person at the moment of, of death. Yeah, so I think it seems as though there really are two dimensions to the another person's death, which is the, the concern for their immortal soul, and then the dimension of simply missing them when they're gone. And um, uh, you know, I, I think what, what Hildebrand is saying that in some ways we, we, we he, he says we can't pretend that that suffering isn't there. Someone that we love is just gone. But in some way it gets, it gets um, encompassed and contextualized by this, as, as, as um, Christopher was saying, this hope that we will be reunited to them in, in eternity. And, um, and I think that can only become real for us gradually and through continuous effort. And that's, that's part of what he does in the second half so beautifully. He writes about, yes, this is actually something, changing our perspective on death is actually a process and something that we have to work at. Uh, well, and maybe we'll, we'll, 
wrap up on this, but he, he also uh, he mentions this quote, I, I believe it was by St. Bernard, um, when his brother had died, might have been Richard of St. Victor, but so that uh, he had said about his brother, you will never forget me. Um, and again, it's this wonderful Hildebrandian inversion. We think often about ourselves not forgetting loved one who's, who's died. And that's, and, and that's very real. Like you won't, you can't, you know, I mean, it, it is just this loss. Um, and you, you might take hope that they're in a better place and all these things that we, that talked about how people find this kind of easy way, but this, but this actually is an easier way, right? Like to remember that you will not forget me. Right? Like I might not be able to interact directly with you. I might not know how you are, but you know how I am. Right? Like, and to be known, right? and again, this is, this is a very biblical, sort of Pauline kind of notion and, and the comfort in being known um, is, is its own love. And I thought that was a, a wonderful observation that um, mm. brings that home. But uh, um, I, I realize we're, we're a little bit over, um, the time we had allotted so and I feel like we should probably start wrapping this up. Thank you everyone for the questions. I, I think we got to most of them at least. Um, and I want to say to everyone in the audience if you if you are interested in these sorts of conversations, uh, I hope you know uh, we have uh, online reading groups now that we host. Um, Maria hosts some of them and, uh, on this book and other books and in which you can participate in conversations. Uh, like this with other uh, Hildebrand Project Associated Scholars and other people. Uh, it's all on our website. You can sign up. It's all completely free. Um, they, they run for a few a few sessions over a few weeks at a time. Um, and we'll have another conversation coming up soon on Hildebrand's ethics on December 2nd, I think. So um, please sign up for that. I hope to see you there as well. And I want to thank all of our panelists for joining us today. Uh, it's great to see you all and to be with you virtually. Um, Always a great conversation. I learned so much talking with each of you. Uh, so thank you, everyone. Um, if this is your first time at the Hildebrand Project, sign up, emails, social media, YouTube. This will be on YouTube uh, soon, all of that. And uh, we're always grateful for all of the support uh, that we get from, from all of you. So thanks, everyone. And thanks for joining us, everyone. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much, David and Maria and Christopher and all our attendees. I hope uh, I hope you guys buy the book. I mean, I wasn't. Oh yeah, buy the book. I forgot. <laughs> Thanks. But, uh, didn't give them the book. <laughs> buy the book. It's only about 110 pages, um, and it's some of Hildebrand's books are are books that maybe Maria can read in five minutes and then be able to explain to us because she's a professional philosopher. And for that, I'm so grateful. Uh, but this book I think is very readable for really for anyone at any level. Um, he reflects and, and Dave with Maria, and, you know, even dove into some of these things. It speaks about prayers from the church, um, scriptures, divine mercy, judgment. I mean, it, he takes also a great collaboration of, of the church's liturgy and its traditions and, and asks us to reflect on our own death. So my parting words are, uh, allow this book to be a reflection also on your own death and the preparation of those people around you who are dying. And um, and I hope it has the same thing that happened to, to David, that you want to go to mass and you want to go to confession and you want to go to adoration. Uh, to be a receptor of uh, of God's mercy is is one of the greatest gifts that Jesus gives us. And by the book. <laughs> <laughs> all right thanks everyone <laughs>